So remember at the very top of the exam paper, it explains to you that if you've got to answer questions by choosing a box, you put a cross in it, not a tick. And if you change your mind, put a line through the cross and then put a new cross where you want your new answer. So question one, sodium chloride is an ionic compound. One property of ionic compounds is that they conduct electricity when molten or in a solution. They do not conduct electricity when solid. Give one other property. So the other key property is they have high melting and boiling points. Second part, identify the reason why ionic compounds conduct electricity when molten. Well, of course, it's not about the electrons, it's about the ions that are then free to move, the positive and negative ions. So it is C. So next question is about metallic bonds. It says potassium and calcium are metals. And in the table here, it gives you information to tell you the melting point of potassium is much lower than calcium and the atomic number of potassium is one less than calcium. So calcium's got one more proton in the nucleus and uh, calcium is in group two. And it says explain why the melting point of potassium is lower than the melting point of calcium. I would always quickly flip to the back of your exam paper to look at the periodic table. So you can see calcium's here and potassium's here. Now this is to do with the metallic bond. And metallic bond is a strong electrostatic attraction between the delocalized electron and the positive ion of the metal. You can clearly see that calcium has a higher melting point, so must have a stronger metallic bond. But why? Well, first of all, calcium is in group two, so has two electrons on its outer shell. So we'll lose both of those in a metallic bond. So it will have two delocalized electrons per ion. And also the calcium ion has a two plus charge, which means the electric attraction will be stronger between the delocalized electrons and the nucleus. So this is how I would write it. Calcium has a higher melting point than potassium because it has stronger metallic bonds, which require a greater energy to break because Calcium ion has two delocalized electrons per ion, and the calcium ion has a two plus charge compared with potassium plus one charge. So next question says, metals burn in oxygen to form metal oxides. Identify the formula for magnesium oxide. And of course, it prompts you to use a periodic table if you need to. So I will turn over to the periodic table. Oh, notice, of course, magnesium is in group two, so it forms a two plus ion by losing two electrons, whereas oxygen is in group six, so it gains two electrons to get a full outer shell, so it forms a minus two ion. If it was magnesium oxide, you've got two plus for magnesium, you've got two minus for oxygen, magnesium loses two electrons, oxygen gains two electrons, that is the formula. So it is A. The next one says, transition metals have different oxidation states. Chromium forms an oxide that has a formula Cr2O3. Give the oxidation number of chromium in Cr2O3. Oxygen always has an oxidation state of 2 minus. So this is uh, a compound and its overall oxidation state will be zero because overall it is not charged. If oxygen has an oxidation state of two minus, then overall we've got three oxygens. So the oxidation state of that altogether is minus six. So I've got minus six for the total oxidation state of the oxygen, which means to cancel out that minus six, I need plus six here. And I've got two chromiums, which means the oxidation state of chromium must be three plus because three twos are six. So the answer is plus three or three plus. Ammonium chloride, ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate are used as fertilizers. 
calculate the relative formula mass of ammonium chloride. So you need to use your periodic table here. And of course, it's a top number that's a relative atomic mass. So we've just got one nitrogen, which has got a relative mass of 14. We've got four hydrogens, which each have a relative mass of one. And we've just got one chlorine atom, which has a relative mass of 35.5. And that altogether is 53.5. Really important to show you're working. Ammonium reacts with sulfuric acid to form ammonium sulfate. Complete the balanced equation for this reaction. So you can see the ammonium sulfate is here. You can see that the ammonia is here. So we've first got to put the formula for sulfuric acid. Now sulfuric acid is hydrogen sulfate. So if you're not sure about the formula, all acids are hydrogen nitrate, hydrogen chloride, or hydrogen sulfate. And you need to know a sulfate ion is a minus two ion, which means we know that hydrogen forms a plus iron plus one iron which means we need two hydrogens in order to donate two electrons to the sulfate ion so that is a formula for sulfuric acid you really should know all your formulas for acids hydrochloric nitric and sulfuric off by heart anyway so you would put that formula there and now once we've done that we need to balance it so the first thing to notice is we've got sulfate there and a sulfate there. Those are the same. But you can see we've got two nitrogens there. And we've only got one here. So I need to multiply the whole of this by two. And that makes uh, our hydrogens, six hydrogens there and two there makes eight altogether. Let's check the hydrogens on this side. We've got two times four is eight. So that is now balanced. You would get one mark for that and one mark for balancing. Figure one shows the arrangement of electrons in the outer shell of an atom of nitrogen and in the atom of hydrogen. So it's showing you that nitrogen has five electrons in all on its outer shell. Hydrogen only has one. Complete the dot and cross diagram to show the bonding in the ammonium ion NH4 plus. Now this is actually a dative coordinated bond, one of them. But you can see nitrogen has to react with four hydrogens here. And one of those is not sharing its electron. So we're going to put a hydrogen here. That's a normal covalent bond. We're going to put a hydrogen here. That's another normal covalent bond. We're going to put a third hydrogen here. That's another normal bond, but the hydrogen here does not share its electron. It has lost its electron because it shares both electrons from the nitrogen. So that is a dative coordinated bond. And that's what makes this a positive charge because that hydrogen has lost its electron. But that isn't part of the question. It's just filling that in but it's worth knowing that that is your dative coordinated bond. Ammonium reacts with nitric acid to form ammonium nitrate. Calculate the mass of ammonia required to make 5.0 grams of ammonium nitrate. The first thing I do is next to the symbol equation put where the masses are so I don't make mistakes. So I know the mass of ammonium nitrate and I'm not working out that, I'm working out the mass of ammonia, so I'm gonna put a question mark there. I'm also gonna look at the molar ratios and that tells me one mole of ammonia reacts with one mole of nitric acid to produce one mole of ammonium nitrate. And you'll notice as well, to make things easier, they normally give you the relative formula mass or the molar mass of the things you need rather than having to calculate them yourself. So the next thing is remembering this equation, the number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass and you need to learn that. So the first thing I need to do is to work out the number of moles of ammonium nitrate I have. 
once I know that, I automatically know the number of moles of ammonia because they react in a one-to-one -one ratio, and then I can find the mass of ammonia. So let's start by working out the number of moles of ammonium nitrate we have. So the number of moles of NH4NO3 is equal to N, which equals the mass divided by the molar mass, which is equal to 5 over 80, which equals 0 0.0625 moles. We know that the ammonium nitrate reacts in a ratio of 1 to 1 with ammonia, so we know the number of moles of ammonia will be the same, 0 0.0625. Now, if you're not confident in rearranging the equation number of moles is mass of a molar mass, then put it into a triangle. And that is going to give you the mass is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass, which will equal 0 0.0625 times 17, which gives you 1.06 grams. Lithium is a metal in group one of your periodic table. What is the name given? To group one of the periodic table. Remember group one when they react with water produce alkali solutions. They are called the alkali metals. The second one are called the alkali earth metals so be careful it's alkali metals. Lithium has an atomic number of three complete the electronic configuration of lithium. Remember, electrons fill up shells, and this is the first shell, the S1 shell. Then you fill up the S2 shell, and then you start filling up the 2P shell. But we only are going to have three electrons. So it will be 1S2, 2S1. That means in the first shell, you've got two electrons, and you start filling up the S shell on the second one, only you only fill up one. The next question is write the equation to show the first ionization energy of lithium. Well, the first ionization energy of lithium is the energy needed to remove one electron per atom of lithium in a gaseous state, a mole of them. So we've got to remove one electron in a gaseous state. So first of all, we're starting with a lithium atom, and we must put in G to show the state that it is in a gaseous state. We're going to remove an electron, so we're left with a lithium ion in a gaseous state, and we've only removed one electron, and so we've got to show that we've moved the electron by putting symbol for electron there. Table 2 shows the atomic number and first ionization energy of some elements in group one. And we're asked to explain why the first ionization energy of group one elements in table two decreases as the atomic number increases. So it's really useful to look at your periodic table as well. And first of all, to remember this, the first ionization energy is the energy needed to remove a valence electron from the atom. So of course the more tightly that valence electron is held to the nucleus the more energy is needed to remove it. So you can clearly see that as you go down the group the valence electron will be held less tightly or less attracted to the nucleus. Why? Well if you have a look the electron shells are increasing which means the distance between the valence electron and the positive nucleus increases and also you've got electron shielding. So less energy is needed to remove that valence electron. So this is how I'd explain it in words. As you go down the group, the electrostatic attraction between the valence electron and the positive nucleus decreases. So less energy is needed to remove the electron because the number of shells is increasing, so atomic radius increases. And secondly, more electron shielding of inner shells.
So water H2O and methane CH4 are simple covalent compounds. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees. The boiling point of methane is minus 164 degrees C. So much, much lower. Explain the difference in boiling points between water and methane in terms of intermolecular forces present. Now, before you put pen to paper on a six mark question, it's really important to think about uh, the science behind this question. And it's really also important to bullet point your answer so that it clearly flows. And the examiner loves bullet points because they can see the science that you're explaining quickly and easily. So first of all, we know there are three types of intermolecular forces. There are temporary dipole to dipole forces, also called van der Waals. There are permanent dipole to dipole forces and there are hydrogen bonds, which are the strongest. Now, non-polar molecules will only experience the temporary dipole to dipole force and methane is a non-polar molecule because the difference in electroactivity between the two is not very much between carbon and hydrogen. Whereas the difference between hydrogen and oxygen is much larger, much, much larger. So water is a dipolar molecule, which means it will experience the stronger permanent dipole to dipole intermolecular force. But it will also experience the hydrogen bond because remember the three highest electronegativities are nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine and they will bond with hydrogen forming a hydrogen bond which is the strongest. That's why water has a much higher boiling point because it experiences all three intermolecular forces whereas methane only experiences one. So this is how I would structure it in an exam question. Both have weak intermolecular forces, so require little energy to overcome these forces between molecules. However, methane is a non-polar molecule as the electronegativity between hydrogen and carbon is small. Methane only experiences the weakest intermolecular force, temporary dipole to dipole between molecules, hence little energy needed to overcome them. Water is a polar molecule as there is a large difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen. This means it not only experiences temporary dipole to dipole forces but also permanent dipole to dipole forces which are stronger. Water also forms hydrogen bonds between a lone pair of electrons on one oxygen atom and the unshielded nucleus of a hydrogen atom on a neighbouring molecule. This is the strongest type of bond. So water experiences all three types of intermolecular forces, so needs much more energy to overcome the forces, hence a higher boiling point.